Thanks, Wesley. Thank you for joining us. And thanks, everybody who's come on to be here with us live. We are recording tonight so that we can post this online and let other people share in this knowledge. Wesley Bias, thanks for joining us. Can you do an uh, intro for yourself or will that be included, embedded in your presentation? Well, we're going to get things going and it is included in my uh, presentation. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for um, being as much of a political lunatic as I am to be spending your uh, Wednesday evening uh, talking about something I really much enjoy talking about, which is campaign finance. Um, just a really quick discussion on even why I'm here. Uh, I'm Wes, I'm a political professional. Uh, in my full-time job, I'm a vice president with a company called Berlin Rosen, um, which we do political strategy and paid media for democratic candidates and organizations all across the country. Um, I'm currently in Pittsburgh right now working out of my hotel room because I have a, a, a shoot for one of my clients tomorrow. Um, but you can see right here, we work with a number of candidates all across the country, um, everything from school board all the way up to Senate and president um, to be able to try to make sure we can help deliver victories. Uh, and before that, I am, uh, always have and will be a New Orleans native. I'm born and bred, and for the first 10 years of my uh, career, worked with um, people like Linda Willard. Linda is one of my political mentors. I always have to make sure to shot that, shot that out. We first met each other 17 years ago now um, when uh, she was leading voter registration for Barack Obama. Um, and ever since then, I've been able to work with people like her in order to try to get victories. Um, so I'm a New Orleans native, born and bred, um, and I'm also here because I am known for being, uh, every year I will have a few threads going on as we talk about campaign finance, um, as we talk about reports, as we talk about donors and expenditures, um, but most importantly, to try to get people more informed on the political process. Um, because at the end of the day, there is a very standard line I think many people here have heard before. And it's really kind of the underlying uh, purpose of even why I do this work. And it comes from Mr. Mark Felt. Um, many people knew him before he revealed himself to be the um, deep throat that gave the initial uh, um, hints to the Washington Post reporters on what was happening with Watergate. And he pretty simply put, follow the money, right? And it's something we've heard in so many contexts, in so many different ways, especially if you've been working in politics, um, but campaign finance reporting research and all of it really is based upon this kind of principle. You follow the money because when you follow the money, you discover trends. And we discover trends in politics, that means things are happening and you need to figure out exactly what those things are happening in general. Um, as part of this training, I wanna really just do like three things. I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about the evolution of campaign finance because it's pretty much a uh, new thing that has come in modern times. I wanna talk a little bit about just basic terminology, talk a little bit about some of the deadlines and where you can find reports um, at, the end of the, at the end of the day or whenever you read an article, uh, whether it's in the Times-Picayune, um, whether it's in The Advocate, uh, whether it's nationwide on Politico, you'll hear people talk about cash on hand and loans and in-kind donations and this language that gets thrown around pretty uh, easily in the political space. But I wanna make sure we understand what that terminology means um, and where it goes. And then also how to read the reports and how to find additional information. Because the reports itself can tell you how much people have spent, how much people have, um, how many donations people have gotten. But it's once you start using the additional search tools that are available outside of an ethics, uh, uh, ethics or a campaign finance website uh, where you can really start finding the real stories. Because ultimately, if you understand how money is received and how money is spent, it tells you how a candidate not only runs a campaign, but how they are potentially are gonna govern, where they're gonna look for or where they may grant access to. Um, in fact, a opponent of a candidate that I have in Texas um, was interviewed by the local newspaper and it was asked and he was asked about 
Um, what do you do? Like, tell me about sort of how do you operate at the state legislature? And he was really like quite honest too about what he, uh, about how he operates. He says people that write checks get access, right? Um, now, admittedly, he also said doesn't mean that they get a yes, but he did say if you write a check, that means that you get access. So it's important to be able to understand on the early end, who are the people that are trying to, at the minimum, get access, get their phone calls returned. Um, and that also helps us to understand the political sort of values, points, and sort of the political uh, backing that a particular candidate has. The one thing that I want to do as I'm going through this is I'll talk, I'll make uh, pauses, I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat. But if there's any questions, concerns, comments, feedback, any of that that comes up, by all means, please make sure just to hop in with a question, let us know what's going on. Um, I want to be able to make sure I'm explaining things. Um, I want to make sure just to kind of, you know, give a overarching view. You can sort of read here what is the, the too long didn't read of campaign finance. And really, when we talk about campaign finance, when we talk about reporting, all of that, it's really just the tracking of every single dollar, whether it is donated through check, through online. Um, you know, in some places you can take cash donations, whether it's a loan that you received, whether it's an in-kind donation. We want to, uh, campaign finance is about understanding where every single dollar came from and where every single dollar has been spent as it relates to promoting political candidates, parties, all of these things. This is important to remember because every single, this is something where I think most people get it, but it's very important just to underline, every single dollar that a campaign or a candidate spends to try to win an election should be tracked. Whether you've raised it, whether you've spent it, every single dollar, in, instead of, in, or in very rare circumstances, every single dollar needs to be tracked. Every single dollar needs to know where it goes. It has to go somewhere. It has to come from somebody. Um, and this is important because people get in trouble. And also just because we've seen sort of in the previous history of campaign finance, for, your, for those of you that may know or are familiar with groups like Tammany Hall in New York that operate in the 18 and 1900s, um, campaign finance was, and it's still in many places, honestly, it's sort of a wild west as it relates to where you can get donations from and where you can get and, and, and where you can spend. It really wasn't until the 70s or so when we really were able to see how campaign finance began to happen. Um, there's really two laws and two sets of cases. I think many people here may be familiar more with the cases than the laws, but I just want to kind of talk about it at the beginning. Um, really, the, the Lynchpin Act happened in 1971 with the Federal Elections Campaign Act, which was the beginning law that really discussed how much can campaigns raise, what's the limits, um, for those that are familiar or may remember the $3 checkbox on the IRS a form where you could donate to a presidential campaign, um, it would be split among the candidates. These things happened in this 1971 Federal Election Campaign Act. And what it also did at that time was it gave not only guidelines for the candidates, but also for the political parties as a whole. And really in that act, it gave them strength to where um, for many people, um, if you ha have been operating prior to sort of the 2000s, the parties, whether they were at the state level or the federal level, held a lot of power because they were able to take in a lot of what was called now soft money, um, money that may not have a particular limit, a uh, money that may not need to go to a particular um, a, a campaign, but these can't, but parties could collect a whole lot of money in which they would use to be able to help support their candidates for president, Congress, legislature, and below. Um, so that's why I think for often we see, or there's still the expectation that the Republican and Democratic parties have a lot of power because they were able to raise a lot of money. Until 2002, when the Feingold-McCain Act, also known as the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, was passed, which not only really honed down on um, the ability, or not to hone down, but the limits of, can of what campaigns and candidates could raise, but it also put harder limits on political parties as far as how much they could raise, where they could raise it from, 
what were the applicable expenses or allowed expenses that they can do. Um, I will tell you, we can have a whole other conversation about it, but the United States slash federal campaign finance law is a lot and it's a mess and we can dig into it. But really the Spine Code McCain Act gave us the beginning of what we now know and sort of the, the operation uh, that we are working with campaigns uh, really in the last three years, the last 30 years, excuse me. Um, and really the two cases which y'all may be familiar with, one of course, Citizens United, which really uh, pushed back on the idea that there needed to be hard set limits for donations that uh, that political parties or PACs uh, could actually um, donate. And the 2014 McCutcheon Act made it to where prior to 2014, you could only as a federal donor donate a certain amount of money, which means you could have donated a little bit of money to uh, some parties. I think it might've been a couple of hundred thousand dollars, which meant that you could max out to a party you could give to a handful of Senate or congressional candidates, but you really couldn't give a lot of money across the board because there were hard limits. Thanks to 20, the 2010 Citizens United law, thanks to the 2014 McCutcheon law, this is now the new environment that we operate in. What I'm really talking about is super PACs did not exist until 2010. And now super PACs, organizations like 527s, there's other numbers I can throw out, um, that are either tax allowed or allowed by the federal government to basically raise unlimited amounts of money to participate in political campaigns. So a lot of, I think, what we've been talking about, particularly as Democrats, as left-leaning people, about how we need to take democracy back and how we have to get money out of politics really stems from these two cases as a whole. In Louisiana, our law got created in 1980. It's called the Campaign Finance Disclosure Act. It guides how local, statewide, how um, local candidates, parish-wide candidates, or candidates that are running within a parish, how they can get money, um, what are their particular limits. And while there's been changes over the last 40 years over what those limits have been, as well as just like the timeliness of how people need to report, um, this is the law that any non-federal election in Louisiana must follow. But I do wanna make sure that I put a little bit of a note. Um, state central committee elections, parish election, parish executive committee elections, whether they're Democratic or Republican, are not governed by the CFDA. There is nothing within the ethics guidelines to be able to, if, you're, if somebody is running um, in, the, in the election happening right now where they have to report any of their dollars, um, or how they spent any of them. And while we've seen a couple of candidates over the last like 15 or 16 years when they've run, have reported these out, there's different guidelines, um, mostly because the parties themselves manage these elections and manage what those guidelines are. But pretty much any other non-federal election in, in Louisiana must follow this campaign act. Um, before we get in there, any kind of questions, anything that comes up on campaign finance before we start like touching on like the top kind of terminology you may need to know. Great, give me five seconds for everybody to answer. Go to the next one. I wanna get into some sort of like key terminology um, that you'll hear get thrown around a lot. Um, it's a uh, um, terminology that I'm using or we'll use often when I'm doing my tweets online about this. Um, the most important one, you know, you can read, but I want to highlight like the most important one that you will hear often is cash on hand, right? Which is simply put, what is the balance of the account um, at the end of a particular reporting period? So um, almost every single elected official in Louisiana has to file a, um, when it's not an election year, what's called an annual report that talks about all of the, so every single person that ran for office last year, um, this year, they're or for this year, for every single donation, for every single expense that they're gonna make, they have to put a report out. The report will, are usually due on the 15th of the next year, but the report goes from January 1st to December 31st. 
So that's why sometimes or often when you see reports, um, there's usually a lag time behind them. It'll, it'll, it will usually be a couple of weeks prior to when you actually have to submit a report um, when a deadline is or reporting period is done. But cash on hand is like one of the most important things to understand and to know. One, because it lets people know how much, how many more resources that you have to spend for a particular campaign. How are you building up towards a particular campaign? Um, it's a signal to the political community of your fundraising, of not only your fundraising strength, but your ability to keep expenses low. Um, because usually you wanna keep most of the funds that you have until the last few months of, or few weeks of an election. So raising a million dollars a year prior to an election is incredible. But if you spent 80% of it and you only have $200,000 on hand, um, seasoned politicals will know that there might be a little bit of an issue going on. Um, you can sort of see funds raised, funds expensed, um, loans, I think, and in-kind donations are very important. Loans are self-explanatory, but in-kind donations are very important as well. Oftentimes, um, businesses or supporters um, may not uh, have the resources to write a check or may not want to write the check, um, but they may want to donate their facilities for a fundraiser, or they may be willing to spend a couple of thousand dollars on flyers and pass them out on behalf of the candidate. But anything that somebody does on for your benefit um, has to be reported. They're still considered donations. And in-kind donations are really, particularly for smaller campaigns, like easy ways to make up gaps in donors and in donations received. Want to really touch on this because um, even though we're in a world where in certain spaces, particularly you have a super PAC, there are unlimited amounts of dollars to spend, um, there are limits. Um, the federal limits change every year. Um, they change their tide based upon inflation um, and go up a little bit every year. I say that because when I first did this training for somebody eight years ago, uh, the limit was $2,800 eight years ago. Now it's $3,300. And that number continues to go up as inflation, as cost of living. Uh, it, it's to ensure that candidates can like max out or get max checks as much as possible. But this chart here kind of just shows you where donations come from, right? It also kind of explains why campaigns have gone the way that they've gone. You can see for a candidate on this first uh, column, um, the limits that a candidate uh, can actually get. It may raise from $3,300 from individuals to $5,000 for PACs. There's hard limits that candidates have to raise and, and worry about, but this is also why on the federal level, and also we saw a little bit on the state level, the, uh, the, 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 the rise of the super PAC, because the super PAC will allow you to raise as much money as you can from pretty much whomever you want to, with not a lot of reporting that has to be done that can be helpful to learn information. Um, Part of that's because of those two cases that I talked about before. But it's important to understand that because this is also why many times candidates will start their own leadership packs or start other political entities because they're trying to find or, or figure ways to raise dollars to win and run and win elections um, and be within the legal limits. So chart for this. Um, these are obviously different than what we have for Louisiana. Um, in Louisiana, we have very specific guidelines on what type of candidates can raise what types of money. Um, you can see here the, the columns on the uh, top will refer to a major district or other office candidate. Um, if anybody wants to hop in, if they know what's basically the difference between a major district or uh, any office candidate, drop that in the chat right now. Like, I want to make sure I'm just not talking about everything, but... Um, you know, there's very distinct guidelines um, within these three columns that dictate what donations can be for what. Um, for major offices is basically any statewide office or anybody that is running parish-wide in New Orleans, in Orleans Parish, East Baton Rouge Parish, and I believe it may also be Caddo as well. 
Anybody that is not one of those statewide or running parishwide in one of those three uh, parishes is considered a district office. Your state legislature, uh, state legislators are considered district offices. For example, most of your police juries or city councils are district offices, right? Um, really, the only um, offices where they are considered other would be your very small sort of town police juries. Um, basically, it's anything where the, the district is about is less than like 40,000 people and it's not state ledge. So the best way to think about this is statewide and your big parishes, the max is 5,000 for your most of your municipal races and most of your state ledge races across the uh, across all 64 parishes will be district and pretty much the very smallest races, your very small police jurors um, will be $1,000 or more. You can also see on this uh, right-hand side, um, the donations or limits that PACs can give, um, either what people can write to or, um, or can receive. And I wanna point out also at the bottom, right? Um, the reason why you will see the Democratic or Republican parties particularly in gubernatorial years, they will run coordinated campaigns. So John Bell Edwards had victory for Louisiana as an example. Um, the Democratic or Republican committees, there are no limits, right? Somebody can write a $10 million check to the Lafayette Democratic Parish Committee and you can take it. There is no limits, right? Um, these are important because it also allows for these parties to really, when used properly, to be able to build power because they can get a lot of larger donations um, from a few or a number of people and then use those resource allocations across the districts that they want to target, the candidates that they need to be able to support and the general organizing operations that they have um, um, going. So this is something I always want to point out of like, what's the usefulness of a really strong party is a very strong party is able to take advantage of these lack of limits to be able to raise dollars to really help support um, their political infrastructure. I want to talk really briefly about where you can find the reports. Um, basically, there's three places um, for federal elections. You always, always, always start at the FEC website. Every federal PAC, every federal candidate has to file there on different reporting periods. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but always start with the FEC website. Um, there may be other places, super PACs, or for instance, the Democratic Governors Association or the Democratic Attorney General's Association. Um, they are not considered in the federal, in the federal, in the FEC standpoint, um, where they need to file with them, they will file with the IRS. Um, and there's a very particular part of the IRS website in which you can find like political donations, particularly if you hear of, um, um, the best way I would explain this is sort of like trade organizations, not trade organizations, but affinity organizations. So like I said, the Democratic Governors Association, there's a Democratic Attorney General's Association, there's a Democratic State uh, Secretary of State's uh, Association. Same thing on the Republican side that operates as what's called a, a 527 organization, which I can dig into, but not right now. Um, and you can also look on the IRS website, but always, always, always start the FEC website. Um, for state elections, you can always go to the ethics.la.gov and click the campaign finance tab. Louisiana is unique in that every state and local elected official um, that is not federal all file at the same place. So it's a lot easier than most other places to be able to find donations because you don't have to hop between, between different parish slash county websites or even different city websites. As you can see on this next tab, um, many places outside of Louisiana manage their own reportings. Um, you know, I, I am... Um, in Pittsburgh right now, um, I spend most of my time in my residence in Brooklyn. The New York City uh, Campaign Finance Board has their whole entire website. And if you want to know anything about any independent expenditure 
or any candidates um, that are running for mayor, public advocate, or council, or, or whatever, you'd go to their specific website. You would not go to the New York State campaign finance website. Um, LA is also an example here. Um, I put Los Angeles and New York City as examples because, in my opinion, they're two of the best um, campaign finance reporting websites in the country um, for very similar reasons, um, partly because you can also find copies of the creative that people make. So you not only get to see how people spend their money, but you also get to see what they're spending it on if they're trying to communicate uh, with voters. But the general census, federal elections, you go to FEC, state elections go to Louisiana ethics uh, site. Um, and unless you uh, are not in Louisiana, you may have to go to an individual city or county's website to find that information. Now, take a break. And now we can start digging a little bit. So I'll invite you to join me in uh, going to the ethics.louisiana.gov website. Um, and we're going to start doing a little bit of digging. Before we start doing some digging, particularly because in these reports, you'll see you can either get them in spreadsheet format or PDF format. The most important things that I think that I always look at when I'm looking at a campaign finance report, particularly if I'm looking at the first two or three pages, I'm looking at contributions. I'm looking at these in-kind donations. I want to see if they if people have loaned themselves any money. Oftentimes you will hear that a candidate will have loaned themselves 10 grand or 50 grand or 100 grand or a million dollars, right? I mean, it's important to understand those loans I and mean, where they come from, partly because um, oftentimes somebody will loan their campaign money, but they will never actually spend any of the money that they loaned because in reality, they actually didn't loan their campaign a goddamn cent, right? They're saying that they loaned their uh, campaign whatever amount of money because they want to make this number at the bottom, the cash on hand as big as possible. Because once, once I, like I said, general politicals want to know how much money you have in your bank account, how much do you have left to be able to spend to communicate with voters. And if you can loan yourself a real or fake loan, half a million dollars to make it seem like you have half a million dollars left to spend, then it seems like you have some strength. Um, but oftentimes you have to follow because candidates will say that they loan themselves some dollars, but they're not actually going to spend any of this. And we can talk about that in a little bit. So with this, I want us to take five minutes. I'll do it too. Um, and I want to just, you know, go on the website and, you know, want us to be able to really see, as I pull this up, um, what does it actually mean to go on the website and look somebody up? So if there is a name, look up your favorite elected or your not favorite elected if you want to look up. But remember, we're going to go to the ethics.gov website right here and hit this campaign finance report. Um, the view reports is where you're going to go if you want to do searches. And um, prior to, I think it was maybe 2013 or 2014, um, smaller races could file uh, physical reports. They could scan and upload. Now, anybody that actually um, is under the campaign finance law for Louisiana has to file electronic. So we'll go here. And if anybody wants to drop in the chat a name you want me to look up, drop a name. Doesn't matter who it is. The main reason why people also like when I do the campaign finance report is that I have no problem putting people on blast. So this is your time. If you're going to drop a name in before I drop one in, take a look. Everybody's doing the search on their own end. We love it. All right. All right. We're going to see uh, Gerald. I got this name first. We're going to drop it in. So you know this is a keyword search. So you, while having the entire name can be useful, definitely, um, as long as you have some part of their name, you'll be able to do a search here. So here we go. We got Gerald, guy Gerald right here. Let's see, looking at this, looks like he ran in 20, I'm assuming he ran in 2019, just looking at some of these reports. Um, and then he may have run again in 2023, but I'm assuming 
either he had a two person race or um, may not have had a challenge. I can explain how I can read that really quickly based upon these dates, but let's take a look at it. So let's see, he was, uh, he was up for election. So let's click this report right here. There's two versions of these reports. So, you know, um, when you click a particular name, I'm going to go to this 10 G one. The reason why I'm doing it is because it gives me a certain set of dates. So I know that it's going to collect all of the information of spending or donations received between this time. So let's click on this. I'm going to click this link because this gives you the ability to download these uh, this data into a spreadsheet. And a little bit later, I'll show you how I've kind of operationalized that work. Um, but I always like looking at a good PDF. Let's zoom in a little bit. Hmm. So we see right here with Jero, we have his report. We can see when he, at least between September and October of last year, he raised $31,000. He got a couple of in-kind donations of $128. But you see here, he spent 62 grand, right? Now this is not abnormal because that debt, that timeline, September and October, is right around when you had the uh, general election. Most times people should be spending a vast majority of their dollars during the, 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 the couple of months, two or three months prior to election day. So not surprised that he, that he spent $62,000. Here's really interesting because it tells you that before, he, before this period started, before uh, it was on the day of 9-25 on September 25th, he had in his account $173,000 and some change. He raised that $31,000. He spent that $62,000. This in-kind donation is not included as a donation because it is not an actual exchange of dollars. It's a service. And that basically cut leaves him with $142,000, right? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. When you start scrolling down into these accounts, you can start seeing, starting here, the contributions. Where did he, he was getting his money from, right? And from here, I can see a number of packs. I can see, you know, he got money from businesses as well. You know, I forgot what the BNSF actually means, but I know this is a major uh, freight company. And you can sort of see a lot of the dollars that Gerald got, particularly the last couple of weeks from the election, um, we're from a lot of businesses and PACs that probably have interest in what Gerald has to do, right? Friends of Franciscan Healthcare PAC, you know, Haas PAC, Humana Healthcare Benefit, you know, there's probably reasons why the Koch brothers gave some money, as you can see here, they gave $1,000, right? Um, we're going to dig a little bit on how to dig more, um, but this is sort of how it starts, right? He got a lot of money from people that probably have business before him and want to gain favor. This is what I would get, gather from this because I see a lot of businesses, a lot of packs. And then when I see here, we can start seeing how that money got spent, right? Now, in the reports, you have to be fairly explicit. So you see here this Freeman's Furniture donated 400 and he got he, he spent $440 on this right here, right? They bought a 20 by 20 foot tent that they're gonna use for whatever events that they wanna host, right? Or no, it's, it's the setup for the tent. Now the actual tent from Freeman's costs $7,000. That's a different conversation I would have, but um, you can sort of see here, this actually lets you know where they're spending their money on. Gerald donated $4,400 for the Iberia Crime Stoppers. So there's these kinds of things that you can dig into. Um, you can also see here, they worked with a, a company called The Political Firm out of Baton Rouge, in which they were paying for political consulting. Um, as a political consultant, what I'm assuming this is, is some type of retainer, right? Um, but these are kind of where I start digging into. Um, really quickly, I'm going to dig into, uh, pull up Mr. Chad Brown's report. Let's see what Mr. Chad Brown's going to go. But while we're doing this, any questions on kind of what I'm talking about, what I'm working through, um, sort of the thought process here?
If you have them, throw them in chat or come off mute, whatever works for you. Okay, we have Mr. Chad Brown. If I look at this report, um, looks like, you know, they have been in, they had a, a pretty serious election in 2015, and then in 2019, and then 2023, maybe not, um, not as challenging of an election. Um, and let's go dig into this report. Let's go dig into actually this one. Let's see how this goes. All right. What throws off alarm bells that something may not be right or wrong? Um, a handful of different things, I would say. Um, and, and the answer is also it depends on how we want to define right or wrong, right? Um, for instance, if I look using Gerald's report that we just looked up, right? As soon as I start seeing a bunch of donations and they're all from PACs, right? Um, or they're all from businesses. The first thing I may look up there is I want to know what committees is is Gerald on, right? Oil and gas donations, right? Is he is he on the natural resources committee, right? Um, I see that he got donations from gaming companies, right? Are they on the board or are they on the legislature that has to deal with gambling, right? Because remember, people, as I said, the quote from the candidate in Texas, right? People are writing checks because they want access. They're also hoping that you're going to vote yes for them, right? Particularly these larger companies. But even people like us who might give 15 or 20 or $25, we're building up a bunch of grassroots dollars to support a candidate because we want that candidate to make decisions that are going to benefit us and not the rich people that are going to write $5,000 checks because they own a gas company, right? Or oil company. But the first thing I may do if I see a lot of different donations from a certain industry is I'm going to go take a look at the committees in which that elected official um, is on now to see if people are trying to buy access, right? Or if it's a new candidate, it helps me to know here are the basis of support that they're going to be looking for. Here are the people that are trying to influence their future decision making. Um, conversely, on the expenditure side, like I said, most campaigns, you want to raise, raise, raise money, and you want to raise money early, but you want to keep as much of it as possible to the last two to three months of an election, um, because that's when most people are going to be paying attention. Um, and in most cases, somewhere between 60 to 75 percent of what you spend should be on direct voter contact, um, some version of paid media and field. Um, the percentage goes higher towards paid media the larger the election is. If it is something that is more local, a school board, a police juror, a city council race, a state ledge race, this is one where you'll want to invest a little bit more in field because it would be easier to knock the number of doors that you'd need to knock. Um, but generally, I am looking for, on the expenditure side, who are you spending your money on? Who are the consultants that you're trying to um, uh, work with? Um, the reason that it, in the conversations that we've had the last few years, um, you may have heard the idea of the democratic establishment or the establishment or the political machine. Um, that's not just because these are terms that we're making up. It's because you can literally dig into the reports of candidates and you can see the consultant that works on this race and works on this race and works on this race and works on this race. And oh, by the way, all four of these different races they worked on, they're all getting an endorsement from the same person, right? So you can start to pull together from the expenditure side. On the donations, you can tell access, right? And who's trying to like influence. On the expenditure side, you can see what are the types of people um, that a campaign are trying to bring into the fold. You can start to see if you really see the patterns and trends. Okay, this person, this larger elected official, likes working with this these four or five um, consultants. And they always work with these four or five consultants. And every person that that, that elected official um, endorses somehow works with these same four or five endorsements. So then from that, or four or five consultants. So then I know, okay, if somebody's working with Wesley Bias all of the time, right? Every person that Wesley Bias works with, I need to see if there's a trend here, right? Because maybe Wesley is working with this set of candidates 
because he's part of A machine or B machine or C machine or whatever. Hope that answers the question right there. Mr. Brown, let's look at Mr. Brown really quickly. Mr. Brown, uh, before last year's election, raised 11 grand. He spent $14,000 of it. Um, he started off the year, he started off 2023 20, with 89,000 and basically spent everything that he raised, right? This is not a typical of a elected official who may not have a um, competitive election. Um, they may raise a little bit of money. They'll usually raise money in the years prior to and almost never have to spend it. Now, good for him, I guess, that out of the 12000 that he raised, if you see on this next page, it shows you uh, contributions received from a political committee. So only about 30%, 25 30% of what he raised came from a PAC. And we can see, look, Adam Zaris wrote $2,000 check, right? At most Energy Corporation wrote $1,500. But also, even though there's not PACs, let's look at it. Allstate wrote a donation. Bristol Myers Squibb, that's pharmaceutical. Sigma's pharmaceutical, right? Like, these are the kinds of things that we want to start. Dow Chemicals, right? Um, the orthopedic pack. Like, these are things that you start wanting to pick up. Um, because like I said, if you know who is trying to influence them, and if you see who they're who's trying to influence them is also on their committee, or for instance, like I, if if Mr. Brown is on the health and welfare committee and he's getting a bunch of donations from insurance companies, I have some questions. That's an alarm bell that might ring for me because then I should start to ask questions on or look at votes of of Mr. Brown that says, um, are you always voting with the insurance companies? Are you always giving them what they want? There's probably a reason why, because they wrote you a big check, right? But oftentimes, even in the in the paid media work that I do, um, I'm looking at these reports because we want to be able to say, to Linda's point, Wesley received uh, $100,000 in donations from oil and gas companies, right? Can we really trust Wesley to, to really stand up um, for communities that are being harmed by uh, climate change, that are being harmed by drilling. Uh, if I've received $100,000 from oil and gas companies, those hits that you see, they come from like this kind of stuff. Look really quickly and then I'm gonna keep going through what he spent his money on, which is, you know, seems about right. Spending money to sponsor the Chamber of Commerce or advertise in the, in the yearbook. This is like pretty standard stuff that, that you would see, particularly in off-year elections. Um, by the way, here's a thing that I definitely want to point out. See this LSU Athletics Department? This is 100% for season tickets at uh, Tiger Stadium, right? Um, as you know, every legislator can buy tickets. And this is usually what you'll see on accounts is that uh, you'll see a check from the campaign account to LSU or the Tiger Athletic Foundation. And it's always for season tickets to LSU football games. Um, let's get back to what we were talking about. Uh, Wesley. Yes. Can we can we look up one more thing? Yes, please. So I did, because we had talked about this earlier, I wanted to look at the Louisiana Democratic Party. Yes, let's do it. So I did ask uh, the former executive director, Stephen Handwork, what accounts they have. And you, you can go ahead and put in while I'm saying this. So there are three accounts or three um, funds that they have. They have a state fund, a federal fund, and a building fund. The building mm -hmm. fund, they don't actually have to report, report. on. Report, that's they, right. That's a rule they do. And they can have multiple checking accounts for each of those funds but they Correct. have one filing for each of those funds that's right and uh just wanted to make note that the house and senate caucuses have their own state accounts as well and this is the house account that linda is talking about so you can pull that up if you'd like um, and then the senate account as well Okay. And then the coordinated campaigns, like you mentioned, Victory for Louisiana for John Bell, it's just a separate checking account, but it would still get filed with the state account. Mm -hmm. So the example is for using the John Bell Edwards Victory Fund, 
Victory for Louisiana Fund. That was the title, the, the as business title for people that worked with them. But to Linda's point, all the donations that were for the coordinated campaign went into some version of a report right here, right? This is the Louisiana Democratic Party state account, right? This is how it's listed. You can find it. Just go back to the days when they would raise a whole bunch of money, right? Um, we'll go here. How about this? We'll just we'll pick 30 days out from 2019, right? In the days when John Bell was raising money and, and trying to get things going. I think somebody on this call worked for the campaign for Louisiana. I won't say any names, Linda, but like, here we go, right? So we see here, this is Louisiana Democrats when they were raising four years ago, leading up to John Bell's reelection, right? In this account, they raised about $300,000. They got about $45,000 in in-kind contributions, which I would guess would be um, venues for fundraisers and things like that. There's also, uh, so that total to 340,000. I have to dig into this other receipts to see what this actually may be. Sometimes this may be either um, for long standing donations, you will invest and like try to get return on your dollars. So you will actually invest uh, dollars in like the market to try to get returns. Sometimes it may be returns of contributions and the like. But you see right here, in this report, they raised right about $400,000. You can see that they spent about $412,000, 390 of it in actual cash. They gave about 20 grand. So at this point, which was uh, 30 days or so before the 2019 gubernatorial election, there was about $369,000 in the account, right? We could probably dig in a little bit and you see where some of these dollars come from. So you see right here, this is AFSCME and uh, AFT. Uh, they wrote big checks, $100,000 each, right? You can see that some of these other, you know, the House Democratic Campaign Committee. So this is the House Caucus gave $13,000. You see multiple campaign accounts. You see the carpenters. So you can really see where the larger and big donations come from, right? Uh, now let's compare this to unfortunately where we're at now, right? And then we're gonna go back in. There's any, there should have been plenty of time to for, for you all to start digging through some of these reports. But if you have any other questions, anything else, let's go. Um, this was filed actually today. So this is a report that is 10 days to the upcoming primary. This report was just filed today, um, and it reports through March 3rd, right? So they raised $11,000, $1,100. There was other receipts of 19 grand. They spent about 38 grand. So we started at $130,000, basically at the beginning of the year. After all the spending is done, there's $111,000 in the state account, right? There may be more dollars in the federal account, um, and you'd be able to find that on the FEC website. Any other questions, things about this? I will also say dig into the House and Senate caucuses um, websites because similarly to the party, they are also raising money to specifically help um, either on the House side, vulnerable House Democrats that may have competitive elections or help candidates in seats where they're challenging Republicans. Same thing in the Senate. So they raise their own amount of dollars that are usually spent on those specific efforts. Um, what are the remedies if someone in org is not filing as they should be or misusing the money? Um, so the, the answer, so I'm gonna give you a number one answer in politics, it depends. Um, if they are not filing as they should be, you would make a complaint to the ethics uh, website I believe you can do it maybe right here, contact. Yeah, I think you can contact them um, and you can file a complaint and you can literally fill out this document um, and upload the complaint and let, the, and let somebody know, let the ethics board know that somebody has not filed on time. The other thing is that if somebody does not file on time, the ethics board will find them every single day until they file, right? 
So some of this you can report immediately. There have been times when I've actually were, was live tweeting of campaign finance reports and made mention that candidates had not filed yet. And I have gotten calls on my cell phone from the candidate or from the elected official saying, I have filed my report, it is not work, it's not working, or I didn't, I, I plum forgot I need to file today. Thanks for the heads up. So sometimes or oftentimes it's because people have not remembered. Um, but if people are doing it on purpose, they are going to be filed by the ethics um, board. Um, they have to go to a hearing. They're going to have to make their case. The ethics board usually gives no slack, so you usually have to end up paying whatever that fine is. Now, misusing money is a different um, is a different sort of it is it, it depends, right? Um, there are pretty there are pretty strict but broad at the same time um, um, regulations on how money should be spent from a campaign account. The general idea is that any and all activities that can be considered part of what it takes or is needed to run a campaign or um, run a party or run a political organization are deemed admissible, right? There are some things you cannot do. So you cannot spend political uh, donations on your rent, for example, right? You can spend political donations on taking some of your constituents out to some event in which you want to celebrate, right? There is completely okay if you want to donate $5,000 to your local 4-H chapter to help sponsor something, right? Um, there are very specific rules, and then there are the, when you start actually seeing how people are spending money, it may not be considered a legal remedy, but there are definitely things that will let you know if somebody is doing something correctly. Uh, an example of that will be if you if somebody's raised half a million dollars um, and then you see they've spent that money maybe six months out or a year out and it's on general consulting. If it's on, you know, expenses that aren't really explained, it just says expenses, Right then you can start asking questions. But from a legal standpoint, there is is kind of broad on what you can spend money on as long as there's a um, explicit um, reason that it can be used to promote political gains, right? So the answer is it depends. And Wesley? Yes. Uh, I think just as a donor and supporter of candidates, also these reports are really significant for people to start to understand and look at because if you're donating any money at all to somebody and you go look at their campaign finance reports and see they're spending their money on frivolous stuff yeah. or just not using their money wisely that that may direct you to think better about how much money mm -hmm. you're getting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. usually most people should be spending their money on paid media on their organizing or their general staff as a whole, right? Um, and maybe there is some money that is left over as it relates to like, you know, mileage because I have to drive from one part of town to the other or whatever, right? Or you make donations to local um, organizations. It is perfectly okay. Somebody can raise $10 million, say I'm never going to run for office and they can write a $10 million check the Louisiana Red Cross, and that will be considered okay, right? But to Linda's point, these reports really help um, politicals and donors understand how somebody is spending their money um, and if it's a wise investment to continue to invest in their campaign. Let's get back here. So I want to talk a little bit, and these are some of the questions that we have, right? I want to look at some different versions of, cam of, of campaign donations. So um, on the left is a report I pulled years ago, um, a bunch of individual donations. I wanted to point this out because if you're from New Orleans, I'm fairly certain you know who these people are. If you don't know who these people are, I'm pretty certain you know the last name. Yes, it is related to that chase, um, but it kind of shows you like where donations come. But 
I also say on the on the right hand side, which is an example of um, either PAC or um, or business donations, because in Louisiana, um, businesses, LLCs, I think everybody here knows that businesses can write checks. LLCs can write checks directly from their bank account to a donor. So I, Wesley Bias, if when Linda Woolard decides she's going to run for governor, I'm going to write a $5,000 check to Linda Woolard. And then for my LLC that I have, I'm going to write a $5,000 check from her. Is that appropriate? I don't know. Um, it is legal. I don't know if it's appropriate, but it is legal, right? And it's also oftentimes how people will like max um, six or seven or eight times. Um, I can distinctly remember a race in, had to be 2010, 2011. Some of you all may know this name I'm about to say, Walker Hines. Walker Hines was running for Secretary of State, I believe. Um, and he didn't get a lot of donations. Um, but most of the donations he got all came from businesses, family members, or Mr. Boise Bollinger himself, right? Blake Meguez has multiple LLCs. This is a great example. So Blake can, can donate to somebody from all 10 of these LLCs. The money, by the way, is probably all coming from the same uh, checking account and will donate many times to people through all of these LLCs. But this is also why it's important to do a little bit more work to figure this out. And I want to use this particular example right here um, that I found when I last did this training in 2017, um, because I think it really explains like the next couple of slides, but why you have to do some of the digging. We all love the middle class. We all want to uh, expand the middle class, right? I saw this on a report and to, uh, to, to the fact check question, it raised a flag for me when I saw this because committee to expand the middle class sounds fine, sure. But I was interested in why was a PAC from San Francisco investing in, in races in New Orleans, right? So let's take a quick break and not a break from like work, but really about where are we looking? So when you see some interesting shit like this, this is where you got to start. Number one, the Secretary of State website is always your friend, right? And what I mean by that is on the Secretary of State, particularly in Louisiana and many other states, they manage the filings of every business, which means that you can actually search up the LLC. So to David's point, you can look up Blake's LLCs by simply going to the Secretary of State website. Um, in fact, I'll click this right here. Right. You can put in whatever name I can't let, let me think about. Yeah, here's one right here. You can tell I, I use this often. I may see this. This is the, the name of a consultant that is used for data in New Orleans. Right. I was interested to figure out, well, who owns this? Right. You up BDPC. This is how it's listed on the donations. Right. On the expenditure sheet. But I can scroll here and look at registered agents and officers and see Greg Rigamer, very well-known data guy, right? So when I see BDPC on reports, I know what it's really saying is Greg Rigamer's work in this election. And as we said before, these kinds of pieces of information help me to be able to understand who's the campaign team that I'm working with or somebody I'm working against has, who's supporting them, because that also helps me to understand like what I'm going up against. But all the time, you know, Secretary of State, super helpful. Um, also, same thing, search engines. Um, the number one answer you heard me in politics is, um, it depends, the number two answer in politics is, did you Google that? Because a 10, 15 minute search, particularly as a, not only just Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo, but if you have a library card, you usually are able to access either Westlaw, which is used mostly by attorneys um, for case searches. You can also use NewsBank. NewsBank is a service that will agglomerate a number of newspapers. In Louisiana, there's a Louisiana newspaper section, and then there is a national section. And the Louisiana newspaper section is like 40 years worth of history. So just digging into using your library card and going to that NewsBank site you can start tracking somebody down a little bit. You can start figuring out their political history. You can start figuring out what their general um, Louisiana history, so to speak, is. I also will recommend sites like followthemoney.com. 
That's an actual real website where they have where they have pulled donations from every single state website, campaign finance website across the country, as well as federal. So where you can look up a name and you can see what they've donated, how they've donated across many, many years. Right. I put my, my own name in there just to, for shits and giggles to see how good it tracks and also to continue to make sure it's tracking my donations. This third one's really important as well, political connections. People like Linda and I who have been doing this way too long, right? We know who's who, who's working under what LLC. If you see this name, we you know, your political, the people that have been doing this work for a while will know that secondhand kind of work. Much like I know BDPC is really Greg Rigamer, the data expert. Other political people know that as well. So having those confidential conversations will also be helpful. But let's go back to this really interesting donation, right? Because the committee to expand the middle class sounds great. Like we said, who doesn't want to expand the middle class? When I saw this, I Googled that name. I literally just put the name in. And this article came up, right? Airbnb suddenly drops $245,000 into local politics. While this election is based in San Francisco uh, and Oakland, it's very clearly in this second in this in the in the second article in the sec second line, right? A new committee set up by Airbnb called the Committee to Expand the Middle Class. They're set up in San Francisco. They were already were doing work in the San Francisco Oakland area, so it's very clear that the person who received this twenty five hundred dollar donation, Airbnb was trying to buy access so that way they could figure out what to do with short term rentals. I'm not going to tell you who this person is, but I think you have enough information. If you Google the name in the ethics website, you'll find out who actually got that $2,500 check, right? But these things are important because this tells a story. Because I knew once I saw this and I did and I did this particular research, oh, this person is going to be listening to Airbnb and they're going to be listening to short-term rentals, right? So now from my organizing and advocacy standpoint, I can tell... Who are the people, if, if, my, if I'm organizing around short-term rentals, um, who are the people, elected officials that initially can be on my side? And who are the people where maybe Airbnb already pulled their ear? And now I have to think about how to talk to them in a different form or fashion because it's a whole lot easier for somebody to, to listen to somebody else if they've written a check. Makes any sense, right? We don't have too much more to go here. Um, we're almost done. Any other questions? Any other things that come up? And while we're doing that, all right, let's see. See? Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? But also at the same time, very important um, because you can find these things out easy enough, right? And just like uh, Fact Check here was able to find it, you can look up that committee you know, you can also look up when you're in that search uh, on that uh, campaign finance ethics page search. Um, you can also look things up, not just by client, by uh, a candidate, but you can also just put in the name, right? I can put in my own name. Let's see who who we've donated to, who I've donated to. Also want to flag, my father is also named Wesley Bias. So there may be some very old donations that he may have at some point in his life decided he wants to donate to a Republican in his old age back in the day. So I just want to flag that for now for any of y'all try to get me. You can tell my donations, all my donations have my name, have the third. So you can see the people who I've donated to, who I've written checks to, all these different kinds of things, right? Same thing you can do for, and to Fact Jack AG's point, you can also go to expenditures as well, and you can type in the name. If you see a consultant on one name or consultant all the time, I can plug in this name right here, and it'll tell me every single place that uh, every single place that a particular consultant has worked, every single time a particular business has received a check, all those different things, right? See, now you have me wanting to see. Who else did the committee also donate to? While we're doing this, I also want this to be a time for you. Dig a little bit more. And the person that you looked up, 
um, if you saw an interesting name um, um, or a name that you had not heard about, uh, drop it in here. See, we can also see right here the two people that donated to. Now, the funny part is look how, even though it's the same, how I got reported in two different ways, right? One said supported by Airbnb Inc., the other did not. You know, checks came six days. This is not to say anybody did anything wrong, but this is also like why campaign finance reporting and reading these things are interesting because we're all we all make mistakes, right? These are people typing this information in. So sometimes there's mistakes. Sometimes people make some kind of tells. All right, Ms. Shirley, is there a reason to be concerned if the report is showing a candidate has refunded money to a donor? Um, not necessarily so. Sometimes it can happen because a donor may have like donated more than the max. So the candidate may have to refund that if all you can take is $5,000. If I'm running for mayor of New Orleans all, and all I can take is $5,000 per person, Linda loves me, so she writes me a check for $10,000. I'm like, Linda, I love that you wrote me a check for $10,000, but I have to give you five grand back because if I don't, I'm going to get in trouble. Now, it can also mean that a candidate has refunded money to a donor because when they have done their due diligence, when they've done their vetting, they realize this donor may actually be problematic to take from um, during the campaign, right? Or in a particular piece, right? Um, for instance, sure, I may be running for mayor of New Orleans and I can take money from any individual or any business. But if Jeff Landry's PAC writes me a $5,000 donation, I'm going to give it back to him, right? I don't need that money. That money's not going to help me politically. In fact, it could harm my particular campaign. No different than as we saw with some of this, right? Um Think about some of the things you could talk about if people knew that Nadine Ramsey, for example, and I can say Nadine Ramsey because I, I, I worked against her on that race, right? And part of what we wanted to pull out to people was she was taking money from Airbnb. So how can we be concerned about the French Quarter, about Treme, about the West Bank when your city council person is taking donations from Airbnb? So the answer I'll say, Shirley, is that Generally, it does not necessarily mean that there is a concern, um, but there might be a question. Usually, it's people are returning dollars because a donor has given way too much, but sometimes it could be a political uh, a political piece as well. Any other questions? Because I think at this point, I'm done with this part. So now this is the fun pieces of this. Also, you can see at the bottom, if you want to email me, please email me. Uh, I used to have my Gmail, but my Gmail is 125,000 unread emails, and it's not on purpose. It's because Google is the worst. If you want to email me, that's the best way to email me. If you want to follow me on IG or Twitter, you know, IG is good if you like good vibes and photos. Twitter is good if you want snarky comments, um, and then particularly when I'm doing campaign finance. But thank you for listening. Um, are there any questions, concerns, comments, feedback, pushback, anything and everything? Please give it to me. I want to make sure people are as enthused about this information uh, and are willing and ready to start doing their own searching because, um, you know, Linda and I talked about this before we got on. Um, oh, I got one for you. Uh, I got one for you. Um, uh, give me one second fact check. Like understanding the expenses and the donations. I learned so much, right? I was able to like exponentially increase the, my understanding of Louisiana politics by doing campaign, by following the money, right? I, because you learn who are the donors and who they're trying to donate to. More importantly, you get to figure out who are the, the campaign consultants. So from a personal business aspect, who are my competitors? From a personal knowledge aspect, who are the teams of people that electives are trying to pull together to be able to help support their race, to be able to support the elected officials as a whole. Um, but number three, it also, to me, like it allows me to be able to start filling in the gaps of the conversations I would be listening to or involved in with more senior politicals, right? They could drop the name of a donor or just the name, or they could drop the name of a consulting company 
And I have no clue what that meant. But then once I realized what that consulting company was, who works with that consulting company and who else have they worked for? It helped me really to be able to understand who your who your potential allies, who your potential opponents, who your potential donors are, right? So well, that was a big one, Wesley. And I wanted to mention that for sure, because on Louisiana Lefty, we're always trying to get Democrats to learn how to run better campaigns and grassroots Democrats to to learn how to fundraise better, because as you have so eloquently pointed out throughout, you need money to run campaigns. So if you're studying campaign finance reports from other candidates, you will see who the donors are. Mm -hmm. And then you can start to develop your own donor list so that when you want to run for office, you can reach out to some of those folks. Just want to make sure you, you, you brought up something that's really important. Um, always 100% for candidates in Louisiana, if there are people who are have value alignment, if they have, uh, if they're supporting you, go to their campaign finance reports, pull the list of their donors, and then start searching for numbers. That being said, remember the number one answer in politics is it depends. It is illegal to do this if you are a federal candidate. So you cannot go to a fed, you cannot go to the FEC website and pull a list of donors and then just start contacting them and say, well, I did it because I saw Linda's running for, for um, Congress. So I just saw your name off of that. That is the actual crime on the federal level. Wait, what, are you, it, what are you saying? So you go look up that I, I donated to someone running for Congress. I can't go so, pull that. So so if you're running, so if you're running for Congress, right? Okay. And so you know Linda's running for Congress in the fall, in case y'all didn't know that, y'all. Um <laughs> and I can go to Linda's FEC report and I can see all the people that she's donated, right? All the people who've donated to me or all to the you, people? to you, donated to you. But what I cannot do is just take that list as is and then start like trying to contact them right you can't do that on the federal end in fact on the federal end as an fyi they put fake donors on the accounts to explicitly find people who do that so what you can't do is i can't pull a list of linda willard's donors as is with the names and addresses and just send them all letters saying donate to me right you can try it, but you have to be mindful of it because you may get in trouble and you may end up like emailing one of their fake donors that are explicitly put in reports to catch people doing shit they're not supposed to do. That being said, if it is a Louisiana candidate, so next year when Linda announces her campaign after, you know, she, she had the tough battle to try to win for Congress and just didn't work out for her, when she's like, you know what, it's time for me to come back home. I'm running for or New Orleans Council at large, I can pull the list of all the people that donated to Linda's um, um, council campaign, and I can 100% make that into a mail list and just mail everybody, okay? It's a little thing, it's more important to be worried about from fundraising, but basically you can take the information straight off the Louisiana website, start calling, start emailing, start mailing them if you can find it. On the federal site, don't do it, you'll get in trouble. Absolutely. Now, my, my favorite fact check, oh my God, I mean, I'm not going to say who the candidate is. And Linda, I think I said this to you when I found it two years ago. Um, there definitely was a, a person who ran for a federal race in which one of their donations um, was from, who was it? From a, it was like sensualist or some kind of shady name. Every single other thing on their report had a name, had an address, had an amount. This one was like, it was like sensualist. Or so. I'm gonna have to find the picture. And they just it just said $300, that's it. And for the life of me, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what it was. Now, what I'm about to say, I have no proof. Is this, is this still recording, Linda? Linda, this is recording. Turn this off right now. Yes. You want me to pause? Yes, please pause. Record again. Yeah, so, you know, all we were just talking about just then was, like, how to bake cookies. So y'all didn't miss anything if, if, if on the pausing. Um, but, you know, I've also seen from my standpoint, I will see where 
look, I also got into this version of the business I'm in now because a friend of mine ran for um, state Senate in 2015. And like we ended up spending a lot of money in ways that we shouldn't have because we got misguided, right? I was not in the consulting world then. Um, but I realized I had to be because when I looked at how much we spent on our video and TV production um, versus what other candidates were spending, I saw that we really spent a lot of money we didn't need to, right? So I think my favorite find is like, you know, that baked cookie recipe that we were talking about. Um, but oftentimes I'm just interested to see how people spend their money. Um, we, 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 we often don't want to spend it on the ways that we can best communicate with people, which is either your field operation or through your mail or your digital uh, ads or whatnot. Um, what we'll usually see is people will pay the local consultant, whatever retainer to do whatever it is that they do. Um, usually it's just to be around. So like part of what I like to see is are campaigns saving money? Are they investing in their campaign staff? Are they investing in their fundraising operations? And are they saving money? So when we're getting to those last critical two months of the campaign, they have enough to run the mail digital TV program that they need to, to contact the voters that they need to in order to win. Okay. Wesley, thank you so much for joining us and walking through that with us. You've got your contact information there for folks and they can find you on Twitter if they have follow-up questions. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight. I hope you have a good one. Thank you all.